Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our New York Giants uh, Preservation Society meeting for today, Thursday, March 24th with Steve Steinberg. Uh, before we get started, uh, just want to do a little uh, housework here. Um, whoever requested any buttons, I sent them out. Unfortunately, some came back. Three or four of them came back. I learned how to tape them up better, so uh, whoever's uh, button did not go out and you told me that they were ripped, I sent out new ones already. Um, we have uh, always have some new uh, members of the group, but I wanna give a special shout out to Pat Gallagher. Uh, Pat was the director of marketing for the San Francisco Giants uh, from the Bob Laurie uh, era all the way to uh, the new ballpark. So Pat, welcome. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we'll get Pat here to speak to us one day and uh, he'll be super. So I'm, I'm really uh, excited about that. Cool. Thank you. Pat, well, really, thank you so much for joining us. Hope, hope we see you on future events as well. Um, tonight we have Steve Steinberg. Steve spoke when we used to have live meetings many years ago and he was gracious, gracious enough to come back because most of the people in here were not uh, you know, able to get into Manhattan. Uh, so this will be a special treat for us. Steve wrote a great book that he's gonna be discussing tonight called 1921 uh, with the Giants and the Yankees. He also has a brand new book out. It's not about the Giants or Yankees, but I'm, you know, I'm gonna give him a minute or so to speak about that. And he's also gonna be doing a book in the near future about New York Giant Mike Donlin. Steve? The floor is yours. Welcome to our meeting tonight, and thank you so much for joining us. Give it up to Steve. That's fine. Thank you, Gary. Um, yeah, Lyle Spatz and I have been working together for about 15 years, and uh, 1921 was the first book that we did, and the focus was on the two teams that uh, won dramatic pennant races, the Giants and Yankees, the first uh, Yankee uh, pennant of all time. And then we went on and we wrote a book about Miller Huggins and Jacob Rupert. And uh, I wrote a biography of Urban Shocker. And Lyle and I recently, uh, uh, actually last year, brought out a book called The Comeback Pictures. Our sweet spot is the teens and 1920s. And it was about uh, two pitchers who perhaps were not uh, Hall of Fame caliber, but they were very good for a long time. Spitballer Jack Quinn, who pitched until he was 50 and Howard Emke, who started game one of the 29 World Series, which is still considered uh, one of the most shocking uh, uh, World Series games of all time. We're working on a book on Mike Donlin, which is uh, going to- More humanitarian assistance, more aid to refugees. I'm sorry? Uh, I apologize. People come no. in here and they don't- it's... Okay, no problem. So uh, Mike Donlin takes us back to the first, uh, uh, to the first uh, decade of the 20th century, a career 334 hitter. We've been shocked by how good he was, but his uh, career was interrupted by a few different things, including uh, being in prison one year, falling in <laughs> love with one of the most famous actresses, vaudeville actresses in America, and going off and walking away from the game at the height of his uh, uh, at the height of his career, and later on appeared in a number of Hollywood movies. So it's really the most fascinating, interesting story that uh, we've ever tackled. So. Um, the three books that Lyle and I have done together um, have all been either the winner or one of the three finalists of the Seymour Medal. This 1921 book uh, it, it was awarded, did win the Seymour Medal. And I'm going to go through this. It's about the Yankees and the uh, Giants. And I'm going to try to focus a little bit more on, obviously, the Giants. And Gary, uh, if we're going to, let's try to do the screen sharing. Absolutely. And uh, this should be a treat if it works because... Uh, Steve, it's all of, yours. Instead of looking at me, you can look at uh, Babe Ruth. So now what do I hit here? Um, you should hit the share screen on your end. Okay, now I don't see that here. And um, I wonder, okay, there it is. Okay. So I'm gonna turn on my slideshow here and, um, and uh, does everybody see the cover of the book okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So basically, uh, 1921 was really a watershed year. We got a jacket blurb from Bob Costas. And, and in his words, it was really uh, one of the pivot points of baseball history. 
And as you may know, until 1919, the first two decades of the century were the dead ball era, low scoring games uh, with, uh, with, without very many home runs, what we'd call small ball. And the goal was to scratch out a precious hit and run and uh, to win the game. And probably Ty Cobb as much as anybody, a rare picture of Cobb smiling early in his career, uh, really exemplified it. But the other guy that really dominated, and we're going to talk a lot about this man here, uh, John McGraw, uh, the legendary manager of the Giants since 1902. They won six pennants. Uh, and John McGraw really owned New York. When 1921 began, I mean, the Yankees had a history of being about as bad a team as there was in baseball. And the Giants really had the following. They'd won the pennants. They had the, uh, even, even the upper class uh, uh, people really follow this team. And McGraw built, uh, uh, really knew how to build a winner. And the New Yorker magazine came out on, in, uh, in the mid-20s. And uh, they ran a profile of McGraw, I think, in one of the very first issues. And the wording that they put there was, John McGraw is baseball. He is the incarnation of the American national sport. So we're going to talk about this and any questions you might have, we'll have a chance to, uh, to discuss them a little bit uh, later on. The, the, the game was going through enormous changes by 1921 to the lively ball era. You know, there were a lot of factors involved, the banning of trick pitches, um, uh, uh, the, uh, like the spitball, the emery ball, though some spitball pitchers were, that already were pitching were given the ability to pitch it till the end of their career clean balls, better yarn at, at the end of World War I. They could use Australian yarn, which wasn't needed for the war effort. But one of the biggest reasons for the beginning of the lively ball era was this guy. And Babe Ruth had come to New York the year earlier, and you know he had an unorthodox swing, an unorthodox uh, batting stance. And it's been said about the Babe that he's lucky that he was a pitcher in the teens, because if he was a hitter, somebody would have tried to change his batting style where he swung from the very end of the bat and literally, uh, you know, put his body into the swing. And, he, you know, he was probably a Hall of Fame pitcher, even if he had not become the great hitter that he was. Um, and uh, he hit an unthinkable 29 home runs in 1919, came to New York and uh, in 1920. And uh, we, we have one quote in our book where I believe it was by the sports writer, Paul Gallico. He wrote, you know, we, we, let me preface it. We don't realize how rare a home run was back then. Nowadays, it's so cheap. But Gallico wrote, the impossible was becoming the possible, uh, the probable. And for a price of admission, you would see right before your eyes uh, the babe utterly demolishing every home run record, uh, just as the verification of the opulence of the times were entering the roaring 20s at the end of the war also. And... Uh, you know, very, very few home runs, and we're going to put that in context in a little bit. Um, interesting picture here. Uh, there's been some mystery around it, but I think it's been solved. Here's, uh, you know, sometimes people wonder, what if, would McGraw have been able to put up with Babe Ruth? And uh, I believe that this was uh, uh, an exhibition game. I, I know that McGraw invited Ruth to tour with him uh, in Cuba because he knew what a drawing power Ruth would be. And really, 1921 was really the, 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 the two most dominant figures in the history of the game, these two men, and they collided, and they collided uh, quite literally in, in, you know, in the World Series, fighting for the future direction of the game. And again, McGraw and the Giants were the number one popular team in New York. The Yankees, like I said, have been traditionally uh, losers. They were in the 1920 pennant race. They had been in the 1916 pennant race, but they never won anything. And, um, and uh, this was the beginning of the time when McGraw's going to rise to some of his greatest achievements. The Giants would win uh, the National League pennant 21, 22, 23, 24, and uh, they would handle the, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, you know, McGraw's seen very much as a dictator, very authoritarian guy. Uh, one of the players on the Giants, Josh DeVore, uh, and I think he's quoted in Larry Ritter's book, said that while McGraw, and I'm quoting, could yell paint off the walls, he knew how to handle people. He was a master at that. And Bill Corum, who was a sports writer for the uh, New York papers, who I think wrote well into the 1950s, uh, wrote in his memoir, you could like McGraw or you could hate him, but you could not be unaware of the fact that McGraw and his giants were there. He taught his players to regard themselves as the very best. And um, 
another picture of McGraw from around this time. Now, um, and here's McGraw with uh, the Yankee bat boy, the giant bat boy, who was uh, one of the uh, part owners of the Giants' son, uh, Judge McQuaid. And um, Ruth had uh, some amazing seasons. And he was once asked why he didn't hit for a fatter average. And he said, and we, we quote on it, my job is to knock them a mile. And that's what the fans expect. In 1920, he hit only, and I say that in quotation marks, 376. If you, if you can imagine, had he gone for a batting average, Joe Sewell of the Indians said he really believed that uh, McGraw would have hit, that uh, the Babe would have hit 500, not 400, 500. Swinging uh, for the fences, striking out, he hit almost 400. And uh, his teammate, Frank Home Run Baker, who's seen here, who was uh, known as Home Run Baker from his years with the Philadelphia Athletics, had a very, very strange quote uh, that we have here in the book, almost like he's looking into the history and perhaps even <laughs> see the jury bonds come along. I thought you'd like this quote. He says, someday the ballparks may be smaller than they are now. And then perhaps some husky slugger will come along to the fore who may break Babe's present record but that doesn't mean anything. Put Babe in some ballparks right now and he would average a home run a day. Um, and Wade Hoyt made similar, the Yankee pitcher made similar comments uh, later on. And uh, there really was Haywood Brune, the famous writer says there was no compromise in his method. Uh, you know, his intent was constantly all or nothing. And when you strike out a lot of times, Ruth, you know, would uh, be like this, totally turned around and almost falling over. Um, the, the, uh, he captivated the nation so much that in the magazine, which is still around called the Nation Magazine, uh, they, there was a story written by, by, by Haywood Green about uh, uh, John Roach Straten. And John Roach Straten was a evangelist, just like we have people, you know, that we hear, whether it's Pat Robertson or others. And uh, Brune had a wonderful story where basically um, John Roach Straten goes to heaven after he dies. And he talks to the Lord and uh, and the Yankees are playing a game uh, and it's a Sunday and he wants the Lord let New York be destroyed, says the preacher. Delay not thy wrath. But the ruler sees that it's the ninth inning of a tie game and uh, Babe Ruth is coming up and uh, he said, let's wait and see what happens here. The article uh, by Brune may have been seen by many as uh, uh, irreverent. But it had to do and related to the great appeal that uh, Babe Ruth uh, that Babe Ruth ever had. I want to give you guys a number in terms of uh, home runs. When Babe Ruth had uh, 59 home runs in 1921 um, uh, and 177 runs scored, I think it may still be the the, the record. He hit 12.4 percent of all the home runs hit in the league. Think about that for a minute, extrapolating, and my math is not great. I hope I'm right here. If Barry Bonds hit 12.4% of all the home runs in the National League in 2001, when he hit 73, he would have had to hit 366 home runs. So let's keep it in context. So home runs become really, you know, watered down now. It was different back then. It was very different back then. Um, and... Uh, the Yankees had a powerful lineup with uh, Frank Baker and Bob Musil. Uh, Bob Musil's on the right-hand side. And uh, both of these teams had a great pennant race. So Lyle and I were originally going to do, one of us was going to do a book about the Yankees in 1921. And then we realized about the Giants. And it was an amazing pennant race uh, that they did have. We'll get into Huggins here in a bit. And, and basically, um, the Giants hosted the Pittsburgh Pirates who led the league by seven and a half games for a five game series in August and seven and a half games behind the giants were in second place. And I think it might've been Tom Meany actually who, who wrote about this, but um, basically McGraw before game one read the riot act to his men. And uh, he, his, it was one of the most dramatic talks that he ever had. He talked about giants history, the pride and history of men who refused to be beaten he pleaded with his team, and and uh, uh, and one sports writer said his voice. He had the voice of an angel. That was Jack Schur, the sports writer. the The Giants swept the five games, and I'm not sure. It's a trivia question. Uh, when uh, you know, sweeping a five game series is pretty darn rare, and they won the pennant going away. The Pirates were reeling. Um, 
The uh, Yankees had a dramatic pennant race with the Cleveland Indians, the defending champions. Yankees were led by uh, Miller Huggins that year. And as you can see, they're wearing a black armband. This is the end of the 19, um, the 1920s season. I, I, I believe, I don't think it was 21. Yeah, it was 1920. Uh, and that's after the death of uh, Ray Chapman at the hands of Yankee pitcher Carl Mays. Uh, and Chapman was hit in the head and, and, and died the next day. So the Yankees wore the black armband. They were one of the teams that did wear it. Uh, the Yankees hosted the Indians um, near, we'll come back to that, near the uh, end, very end of the season. And it was a dramatic four game series. The Yankees led by one game going into game four and they pulled it out in dramatic fashion, eight to seven. And uh, Fred Lieb, the sports writer in the 1940s in Who's Who in Baseball, wrote about the 10 greatest games of all time. And he had that game as one of them. And, and Ruth just terrorized the Indians. If they had walked him every time he came up, uh, they would have won easily. And the interesting thing about Fred Lieb is I think he was at every one of those 10 greatest games of all time. Uh, as one of the early sports writers that came up in the 18, 1908, 1909. Um, the the uh, Yankees then uh, took a two-game lead. It would Otherwise, the pennant, would have been, uh, the pennant race would have been tied. And uh, Babe Ruth hit 727 in the series, 16 plate appearances on base 13 times. And basically, now we're into the World Series. And Babe Ruth uh, was a difficult guy to manage. Here he's seen with Colonel Histon who was the co-owner with Jacob Rupert. And it was pretty hard for Miller Huggins to control the, uh, the uh, fun-loving playboy uh, lifestyle Babe Ruth when the co-owner of the Yankees went out drinking with the babe every night. So if you're the manager, how, uh, you know, how do you try to criticize uh, uh, your, uh, your player when uh, the, your, that player is you know, a, a favorite of one of the owners of the team? And uh, Huggins had few uh, friends in the press and the pressure really got to him. Lyle and I actually had uncovered the fact that it looks like Miller Huggins had a nervous breakdown at the end of the 1920 season. And one of the real finds that we have, I, I do a lot of microfilm work. And in the uh, time period that we write about, New York City had something like 11 or 12 daily newspapers. And if you think about it, each one had their own beat writer. Each one had their own sports editor. They all had their own ins. We actually uncovered that in two of the minor papers in New York, that late in that season, before that Cleveland series, Miller Huggins resigned. The Yankees blew a big lead in a game with the Tigers. Huggins sent his letter of resignation to Jacob Rupert, who did who uh, basically refused to accept it. And uh, Huggins obviously stayed on. He he by as by the way died quite young, and uh, he when he was fifty, he looked like he was seventy. But I guess uh, that's what happens if uh, you're trying to manage Babe Ruth. Um, the, the Yankees got Ruth just as an aside when they bought him from uh, the uh, Boston Red Sox. And the famous story was uh, that Miller Huggins told the owner, Rupert, to buy the babe. And Jacob Rupert said, Huggins, because uh, the Red Sox wanted $100,000, Huggins, you are crazy. This is word for word. And that man, Frazee, is even crazier. And the reply that Miller Huggins gave was, Colonel, take my advice, buy Ruth. For Z is crazy. Yes, he's crazy to let you have the babe for so little. And that was uh, the man that led the Yankees to six pennants in the 19, uh, 1920s. In the 1921 World Series, when the two, um, here's uh, Huggins with uh, Rupert, who was really a, a, a real backer of him. And in our second book, we really look into the relationship, these guys, two such different men, but in many ways, they had some remarkable similarities. And uh, the, you know, the World Series was really described as a series between McGraw and Ruth, you know, because Huggins was sort of underestimated. He was a bland personality. And uh, we, we've seen enough accounts that we could probably uh, fairly comfortably say that McGraw um, basically called every pitch of the series. The giant pitchers would turn around before every pitch. Uh, after game game eight, and we'll talk about it, he, McGraw said, I signaled every pitch to Ruth, reveling in having pre prevented the babe uh, from continuing his heroics. It was no secret. You could see uh, either Frank Snyder or Earl Smith, the catchers, turn and look to the bench. We pitched only only nine curveballs and three fa uh, fastballs to Ruth 
the entire series. A lot of all the rest were slow balls. And of the 12 of those, 11 set him on his ear. And in the, a year later, in 1922, the Babe would have equally poor success in the World Series against, uh, against the Giants. And, you know, uh, John McGraw did not like the lively ball. He loved, he loved the small ball of the dead ball era. But one thing that really surprised us that we um, discovered was McGraw did not like to sacrifice. As much as he loved the dead ball era, McGraw instinctively knew that an out was precious. He loved the hit and run, and he loved to put the game in motion, but he would not sacrifice. And even in, in the early 1920s, he began to play for the big inning, and he was famous for uh, telling his players to be very patient at the plate and, and work the pitchers. And then all of a sudden, maybe the middle of an inning, the beginning of the inning, he said, now I want you to jump on everything. So all the pitchers were now sort of getting comfortable that the giant batters were taking so many pitches. Now they were slamming and they were going from one extreme to the other. And, and uh, he, he, uh, he called it. Um, basically, uh, this is a picture earlier than 1921 of a little bit younger Jacob Rupert with Mayor uh, John Ferroy Mitchell. I think is when Rupert had bought the team. This is probably 1916 or 1917. And... Um, and now we are, and ironically, when the new owner of the uh, uh, New York Yankees, Jacob Rupert, bought the team, John McGraw actually helped put the match together. He was really the matchmaker. Maker. Uh, that's George Stallings of the Miracle Braves on the right-hand side. So McGraw would probably regret the fact that he, he brought this money man who was so determined to build a winner, uh, as uh, Rupert would do. And... Um, uh, McGraw obviously uh, wore the uniform uh, quite often, and he really um, owned New York. I mean, Damon Runyon, the famous writer, we have a quote in here. He said, McGraw had an appreciation and a haughty pride in representing uh, New York, the big town, beyond any man the writer had ever met. And, um, and, and that was McGraw. Um, he, he, and, you know, he said about the lively ball era, I do not like the lively ball. The great loss to me is the thrill that I got of seeing men shoot down the base paths one after another until they had stolen their way to a win. That was baseball. And before the World Series, he rather arrogantly said, why should we, shouldn't we pitch to Ruth? I've said it before and I'll say it again. We pitched to better hitters than Ruth in the National League. And maybe part of that was bluster. Part of that was Rogers Hornsby, who was uh, on a run of uh, five years. I think he hit over 400. And just as an aside, and, you know, we'll hear a lot about that. And you've probably heard from my, my friend and colleague, Rob Garrett, who's working on the Charles Stoneham book, that the Giants tried very hard in the early 1920s to get, uh, to get uh, Rogers Hornsby. And uh, there's, you know, the interesting story behind the Hornsby for first trade, but that was a lot later. And um, the World Series was really a series for the ages. Now, the World Series in 1920 and 21 was nine games long, best of nine, not a best of seven. I think they were trying to make up some of the revenue they lost from the war. And uh, basically, it could have been a book of its own with the drama and the surprises. Sid Mercer, the, uh, another one of these young writers who ended up uh, writing, you know, a uh, sports writer into the 40s, maybe the 50s, he declared that after game five, uh, the fans were in, and I quote, a state of nervous collapse. If the boys continue to play those close games, the Undertakers will win the series. There were a lot of compelling uh, events here. Babe Ruth had a series of injuries, and when he had slid, he had aggravated an infection, of course, long before antibiotics in his arm. And there were actually newspaper reports. I'm quoting one from the Boston Herald. There is grave doubt in surgical circles of the ability to save the babe's left arm from amputation. That's how serious it was. And uh, the Babe missed a few of the games near the end, the last few games of the series, whether he would have made a difference. He certainly was not doing that much in the, in, in the early games. Um, one of the other big stories is Wade Hoyt of the Yankees. He pitched brilliantly. He did not give up a run in three uh, complete games, but unfortunately he was destined to lose the eighth and final game, uh, one to nothing on an unearned run. And um, 
here's the babe with a young fan. Um, and uh, obviously he was, you know, pretty captivating uh, with the kids. And, um, and here's Wade Hoyt with his uh, father and mother and uh, something to be said about the style of hats in those days. I, I don't think uh, Wade Hoyt's mother was a pirate fan, but she certainly liked his pirate hats. So, um, and one of the stars of the Giants obviously was Frankie Frisch. Uh, he went directly from college at Fordham University, no minor leagues. He started baseball, football, basketball, track at Fordham, and he was a natural leader. And, uh, and his best sport, uh, it was said, may have been uh, football, where he was a ha halfback, and he was on the All-American team in 1918. And I, I suppose today he would be, uh, Frisch would probably be, we'll come to Phil Douglas here in a second, Frisch would probably be drafted by both the NFL and Major League Baseball. Phil Douglas was an alcoholic pitcher, and, ba and John McGraw loved to take problem child. Uh, he, he, and we're certainly seeing this with O'Donnell work 20 years earlier, uh, um, he, he loved to take uh, uh, players that had personal problems, usually drinking, and felt that he could control them. Uh, Phil Douglas was very good in 1921. He would be banned from baseball for making threats of throwing games uh, a, a year later, but in 21 and in the 21 World Series, he was brilliant. You know, one of the things that we notice in this series, and uh, obviously before the day of television, is, you know, there is no instant replay. And there were some very close plays during the game, and you see one writer in one paper saying one thing and another writer in a paper saying something totally differently. And, you know, you just don't know because we don't have it on, you know, we don't have it on, on film, there was a famous steal of home with Mike McNally of the Yankees did, and uh, different sports writers uh, blamed one. You know, one blamed the catcher for not getting the ball. You know, make the tag. One blamed Douglas, the pitcher, for winding up too slowly. And uh, again, we just we really, really don't know. And uh, D Douglas would turn out to be brilliant in this uh, series. You know, one one thing to give the credit to. You know, people were saying this was the. Uh, the lively ball era, it's pretty interesting that when you had good pitchers, they were able to keep, keep the hitting down. And the Yankees won the first two games of the series. And I, I think to the credit of Miller Huggins, he played for the hit and run. He actually sacrificed because he knew that the pitchers that the Giants had were very good. And the Yankees won both those games three to nothing. So I think it's a reflection on Huggins' ability to be flexible and, uh, and, and to adjust according to the, uh, the needs. Carl Mays, the famous uh, pitcher uh, 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 who, uh, uh, whose pitch killed uh, Ray Chapman a year earlier, uh, very controversial. Uh, Mays was not a well-liked player. And there's been a lot of controversy for many years that Carl Mays may have thrown one of the World Series games in this 1921 World Series not going into all the details. I mean, Lyle and I come down on the fact that, you know, probably wasn't the case. We noted he had a lead and he faded in the late innings, but during the season, he faded a lot. And uh, it's some people think that Carl Mays would be in the Hall of Fame if not for this. I believe he won over 200 games, nowhere near 300, but um, uh, he, he was brilliant in this series. Um, he won 27 games. And what he did in this series is pretty remarkable. In his three games, uh, and he didn't win all three of them, he did not walk a single player in 27 innings. And I don't think that's ever been done in the history of the World Series. You know, Wade Hoyt uh, did not give up an earned run. And while people talk about Christy Mathewson in 1905, um, Lyle and I have pointed out that the Giants of 1921 were a much better hitting team than Connie Max Athletics in 1905. And that really, okay, Hoyt didn't win that last game, uh, but uh, his achievement of giving up no earned runs is probably uh, more than um, Matthewson's. And um, and uh, here's Frankie Frisch, uh, the star of the uh, uh, of Giants. That's Huey Jennings, the uh, uh, former uh, manager of the Detroit Tigers, who joined McGraw as a coach. Uh, on the 21 team. Uh, Jennings was McGraw's teammate uh, on, on the great Baltimore teams of the 1890s. And uh, uh, fr uh, Frisch, by the way, in 1921, give you an idea, he hit 341, he had 211 hits, 
49 stolen bases. That was really the season that uh, that he uh, he really emerged as a superstar and would be one until he and McGraw had a big falling out after or late in the 26th season. And Frisch ends up on the uh, Cardinals and Hornsby comes to the Giants. But that's another story for another day. Um, it was really a clash of two teams with deep pocketed owners. Uh, the, the Stoneham family and R Rupert and Houston was still a co-owner of the Yankees at that time. And um, here are the fans uh, in uh, the, the bleachers uh, during one of the World Series games. Um, keep in mind, Yankee Stadium had not been built for two more years. Uh, we go into the controversy. The Yankees were basically renting and paying their landlords it was the Giants. And that's a big part of the Stoneham story when uh, he forced the Yankees out and then the, the Yankees actually build a bigger and a better stadium. Although McGraw, who was probably no demographer, thought they would die over in the Bronx. But um, the Giants and the Yankees, again, they were fighting for New York. Uh, the, obviously, no TV. This is not even radio. There, there was a broadcast during the 21 series. You know, very few people, you know, probably listened to it. The Giants outdrew the number two team in the National League that year by 39%, and the Yankees outdrew the number two team by 64%. And there was a, a really a love-hate relationship between other teams and the New York teams. They shared the gate. So when, when your team came to New York, you knew as an owner, at least, that you were going to take home a very nice check. And uh, so you know, that, that made it a little bit more complicated uh, in terms of how the other teams felt about the uh, uh, about the uh, these two powerhouse teams. Um, I think McGraw was still on top here, and it wouldn't be until 1923 that the Yankees basically had their stadium and they won their um, they won their first World Series. And uh, the, this, this was a, a, a really colorful giant team. I should mention here that one of the guys on the team who came over during the season was Casey Stengel who really became a disciple of McGraw and people that diagram managers and you can almost have like a managerial tree, like they have even in football, you know, Bill Walsh and who are the people who studied under Walsh, but uh, Stengel played for McGraw. And uh, we have a famous story there where he, he I believe I'm um, trying to remember was he on the Phillies or the, uh, the pirates and he had injured his leg and the trainer was working on his leg. When the news was told to him that you've been traded to McGraw's giants and Stengel immediately jumped up and started dancing. And the trainer said, my God, I thought something wrong with your leg. He said, I've been traded to the giant, to the giants. I'm fine. And, you know, keep in mind in those days, the, the, the world series check was more than the players, you know, salary, um, you know, world series, the, the players would take home uh, winning team, losing, maybe the winning team, six, $7,000, losing team, $5,000. That's a ballpark number. So it, 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 was a, it was a big thing. And ultimately in this series, the Yankees had two great peach pitchers in Mo Mays and Hoyt. And the Giants really had three. And that's what it came down to ultimately. And uh, the Yankees won the first two games. They were leading game three, four to nothing. And uh, the Giants and McGraw here, just like uh, the Yankees played small ball in the first two games, McGraw played for the big inning. And they stormed back and uh, beat the Yankees in game three. Bob Shockey was the Yankee pitcher. It was a little sad because he'd been the great Yankee pitcher from the mid-teens, but he, he wasn't having a good year and uh, was not on top of his game as he had been a few years earlier. Um, and But it, it really was obvious at this point that, uh, and, and here's the stadium before it was remodeled. I think this is an early shot around the time that, uh, that we uh, um, uh, write about in 1921. And uh, the, the Yankees were making their presence known and people loved the babe. And Sunday baseball had just been legalized. I think it was during the 1990s season. And it used to be that the middle class or the lower middle class could not go to ball games. People were working six days a week. Maybe you could go on July the 4th or something. And uh, the lively ball made it a lot easier for immigrant uh, kids to relate to the game. It's a lot easier to see a home run and understand what's happening than to learn this new game and see somebody work a walk, steal second, go to third on a 
on a ground ball to the right side and come home on a fly ball. And uh, it was uh, when McGraw took over, when uh, uh, Miller Huggins took over the Yankees in 1918, uh, after the 17th season, he was told, by, or McGraw was told, now you have a man who will go 50-50 with you in New York. And McGraw's reply was, no man will ever go 50-50 with me there. And ultimately, although we don't see it quite in 1921, the Yankees would uh, take much more than 50-50 as they continued uh, you know, to roll through the decade. And, um, and uh, you know, th this man, uh, you know, like I said, he had some of his uh, greatest years the, the, the Giants did not have overpowering pitching uh, like a lot of wealthy teams. They were picking up uh, ball players from a couple of the poor teams. Uh, McGraw used to get some talent from uh, both the Braves and the Phillies that have financial problems. Irish Musel, Bob Musel's brother, came over during the 1921 season and was key to the, to the team. And, and again, the, uh, you know, the Giants used their money effectively and, uh, and uh, built a winner. And, uh, um, you know, McGraw, like I said, went on to have, you know, some of his greatest times. And this is a picture of actually a better shot of Huggins. The Yankees in 21 and 22 actually wore the striped hat, which helps, um, would help you identify the years. I don't know how many of you guys are aware of the, the website, Dress to the Nines, which is a wonderful website that a, uh, um, uh, the late Ray Ockenden had developed and now is managed by the Baseball Hall of Fame. And you can go in and you can pick your teams and pick your years and see everything from the socks to the uniforms to the hats. And a lot of times if you have a picture and you're wondering, you know, what year was this picture from? The Dress to the Nines website is, is just a, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, tool. So, um, this was a great series. Like I said, in the uh, eighth and final game, the uh, the Giants had a runner on second base and a ground ball that their uh, their captain, Roger Peckinpah, misplayed. And uh, the runner came all the way in to score. It was one to nothing in the first inning, and it ended up being one to nothing. Babe Ruth did pinch hit. He hadn't played in three games. And um, I think he popped out, but he was still hurting because of his arm injury. And, you know, obviously did recover during the offseason and, uh, uh, you know, continued to have some uh, great years. But 59 home runs this year, it wouldn't be until 1927 that he would have more. It was this was a difficult team uh, for Huggins to manage because you had prima donnas on the team and you had guys that had really been stars elsewhere, like Ruth and Carl Mays. And uh, just one comment, as people look at the Yankees, a lot of times we think of them as being great during the 1920s. And they were really two different teams because in the late 20s, after Ruth had been suspended and fined, you really had a lot more players that minded their own business as exemplified by uh, Yerig and Lazari. These were, uh, and even uh, Earl Coombs that, you know, quietly went, went about their job and, and weren't uh, rabble rousers and, tr and, and, and troublemakers. Um, and McGraw, after 1924, uh, was destined uh, not to win another pennant. And that led to some of his frustration, his falling out, taking it out on his star player, um, Rogers Hornsby. But um, that's really the, the talk. And I, I welcome any uh, questions or, 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 or comments. And um, uh, it ultimately, uh, again, was Ruth against McGraw, even though the two managers were obviously Huggins and McGraw. Steve, great presentation. Thank you so much. If you want to uh, stop the share screen, we can get started with questions. Uh, first of all, I got a quick one for you. Um, how uh, how did we go get the book or the series of books that you and Lyle uh, did? What's the best way to get the book? Well, all of our books are available just about anywhere. They can be ordered at your uh, uh, indie bookstore or local bookstore or obviously Amazon, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble and our books are, uh, are, 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 you know, widely available. We've done all of our books with the University of Nebraska Press. They are a quality house. And this year, and I think for the second time, uh, there are three finalists for this, this more medal for the best baseball biography history. And all three books this year, of course, Steve Treater's 
uh, Horace Tonum was was the winner. Ours was one of the other two uh, finalists. All three of the books were Nebraska books. They can also be gotten through the University of Nebraska website. Thank you so much. Now, I know there was no uh, MVP back then. Uh, who would have, who in your eyes uh, would have been the recipients? Well, it probably would have, it, it probably would have been Ruth. And, you know, when they, uh, when they started having the voting, uh, they would only, once a player won it, he couldn't win it another year. But I mean, you know, R Ruth was so towering. Again, when you look at, you know, to hit almost 400 and to hit a number of home runs that is, is just mind boggling, uh, really was. Uh, people would be very upset. If you were a fan of the St. Louis Browns and you went to St. Louis and Urban Shocker walked Babe Ruth a couple of times, you wanted your Browns to win. But gosh, you didn't pay that admission price to get the Babe to take a stroll to first base. I, I should have clarified. I meant in the World Series. Oh, wow. Wow. That's, um, you know, that would, uh, that would probably be, you know, one of the giant pitchers like Earl, uh, Earl Neff. Who, um, yeah, I'd have to give that a, a little bit of thought. Nothing pops up right away. It, it, it was such a such a dramatic and, and, and close series. I mean, McGraw would probably say that he should be the MVP because he called every pitch. Um, but uh, yeah, there there were some clutch performers, and you know, you had a guy that came over in the in the musical trade named Johnny Rawlings, and he became a hero. And he was that typical guy in the World Series that really is not a star that somehow shines in the biggest stage. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we had one question in the chat. Jeff Cohen, you want to ask your question about the cover of the book? You're on mute, Jeff. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Gary. Yeah, my, my question is, I just didn't recognize except for uh, Babe Ruth on who's the cover on the cover of the book. Um, uh, the cover of the book for the Yankees is Frank Homer and Baker in the middle and, uh, and Bob Musil on the right. And let me, uh, just, uh, grab the, uh, uh, the book here and, uh, Irish Musil, who is Bob's brother is on the right for the giants. And they look very similar. They're not, they weren't twins, but, uh, brothers are in it. And if I'm not mistaken, in 1920, the Johnston brothers, uh, Brooklyn and Cleveland might have both been in the World Series. And that's Casey Stengel on the left. Uh, the one on uh, second on the left is a pretty obscure player named Bill Cunningham. He actually played in my hometown in Seattle for a while, uh, either that year or the year before. And Ross Youngs is the one second from the right, who John McGraw always felt was the greatest outfielder he ever had. And Ross Youngs died in the mid-1920s. I think it might have been uh, kidney disease, Bright's disease, I'm not sure. And, and Nebraska does a great job of all of our books. I mean, you know, I give them, uh, we, I make, I, I, I collect baseball wire photos and I draw in a lot of collectors that I know, but uh, Nebraska is very creative on uh, the covers. We love it. Yeah, you know, we had, um, Thank you. we had George Burns' uh, great, great nephew on talking about him. And I, I, I looked up the stats. He had a very good uh, series as well. Yeah, he was such a classy player and ultimately, um, you know, they, they traded him away, but yeah, he was, you know, the, the giants didn't have, I mean, you know, single became a colorful guy, but, uh, you know, the Yankees had, you know, Ruth just, Ruth is over, you know, his shadow just overpowered everything. He just towered over everything. He was, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, uh, Tommy Holmes was, and maybe some of the people listening here remember Tommy Holmes, uh, who, who wrote for the Brook one of the Brooklyn papers, I think the Eagle, and Holmes covered uh, like so many of these writers when he was young in the 1920s. And he once said, I think maybe in the late 30s, early 40s, he said, I stopped telling people Babe Ruth stories. You know why? They just didn't believe me. <laughs> they just didn't believe me. And, and they were true stories. You know, a lot of times you hear stories and they get embellished. And now with retro sheet, we can go back and see, oh, is that really true or not? But that was Holmes' comment. All right, we got Mars, then Charles, then Dave, then Steve. Mars, you're up. And me, you got me? And you, Frank. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for joining us. I, I must have purchased that book several years ago, and then I, I loaned it out to a couple of friends who loved it. Uh, I, I had, uh, you know, great uncles, uh, grandfathers that were following the Giants from the turn of the century, 
And there was something mentioned about Oni Madden. So it's, it's not only about baseball, but it's about the city of New York and what was going on, as you know, uh, with the Cotton Club owned by the gangster Oni Madden. The question, the question I have, do you know what percentage of the New York Giants John McGraw owned? You know, that would be a question that uh, uh, Rob Garrett would answer very easily. And I know Rob had told me he's going to, I think he's traveling or in transit today. Uh, Rob lives not, not I mean, in, in Western Washington. I want to say it's about 10%. It, it, it wasn't a, uh, a huge amount, but uh, he had about 10%. Well, the reason why I ask is because apparently from what I read, he was the one that evicted the Yankees after renting to them for eight years because the Yankees would Babe Ruth draw a million people, the first team to draw a million and in the polo grounds. So McGraw was in sense and he made the decision to uh, evict the Yankees. You know, you, you, you may very well be right. You know, McGraw, even when he wasn't an owner, uh, he was given so much latitude by the Brush family after John Brush died, died in 1912. And even going back, you know, the, the, the Giants refused to play the World Series in 1904 because they didn't want to play the upstart American League. And Lyle and I are writing about Mike Donlan, who was a star at that time. And it's very murky. Was it McGraw or was it um, or was it Brush? But I think McGraw had so much respect of, uh, you know, first it became uh, first it was Brush and then the Brush family and, and, and then Stoneham. Um, that uh, although it gets very interesting with the, the, and again, I think Rob Garrett will get into it when the Giants uh, only kept Hornsby for one year. And you would have thought that Hornsby clashed with McGraw. It was actually with, with Stonen. So yeah, McGraw was almost like an owner long before he was an owner. And, you know, they, they saw how much money he made for them. Uh, you know, the Giants were, uh, you know, we talk about the Yankees being bad before Rupert got there. I mean, I don't remember how many managers the, the Giants went through, you know, in the late 1890s in the beginning of the 20th century. They were they they made a ton of money. Thank Thanks you, very Mark. much. Charles, you're up. Okay, my question is, um, are you ever gonna do a book on the 1922 Giants? And the only reason I'm asking is because I'm probably one of the few people out there who has a 1922 New York Giants World Series ring, which I got from the granddaughter of the backup catcher, and Alex Gaston. Who, oh, Alex Gaston, okay. Um, yeah. No, I don't think so. If I'm not mistaken, I, that was not a very colorful pennant race. I think they won going away. The dramatic pennant race was obviously in the American League, and I've written a biography of Urban Shocker, and that, uh, but that doesn't really focus on the National League pennant race. And, and the uh, Browns, even though they won the pennant in the 1940s and 44, that was really the best Brown team of all time. And they fell one game short of the Yankees. And who knows, maybe they would have, uh, they, they would have given, it was a four game sweep. And uh, that uh, was a really good team. But if you go back over that team in 22 and even 21, you don't have, you don't say, oh my gosh, there's so much talent on this giant team. It's obvious they're gonna win the World Series. So McGraw did know how to build a winner. And uh, what he did in 22, I think 22 was the year that the babe hit 118 and he played in all, all four games, but he just couldn't, he just couldn't do anything. He did turn it around in, 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 in 23, but uh, um, yeah, Alex Gaston had a brother who was a pitcher named Milt Gaston. And when I got going in my baseball writing and urban shocker was the guy that really drew me into all this even though I didn't write the book until many, many years later. And I remember Norman Mock, the, the baseball writer and historian, interviewed Milt Gaston when Milt was in his late 19, in his late 90s and asked Alex Gaston's brother, you were a Yankee pitcher in 1925. Why, why did you leave the Yankees? And, and the answer was shocker. The Yankees wanted shocker. He was a star. They had him in the teams. They wanted to get him back. And I don't know how, I think Milt actually lived to be 100. I don't know how late, how, how late as Gaston. And actually, I actually. I think he lived into his mid 80s. I think I remember his granddaughter telling me that. You know, it, it, just as an yeah. aside, I, I, I dabble in wire photo auctions. I literally now, I think I just picked up a picture of Milt and his brother Alex 
And if somehow you can get me an email, I'd be happy to send you a, a scan of that picture. It hasn't arrived yet. Uh, I would love to see it. Yeah, um, I will it. send uh, I'll, Gary I'll take, my email address yeah, I'll take and care connect of it. us. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Charles. But uh, I, know, I know 1922 was also the first year they did rings. And prior to that, it was stick pins or money clips and things like that. In or or watch fobs or watch fobs. Yeah. That was the other one. Yeah. So I kind Charles. of like. Thank okay. you, Gary. Dave Lipman, you're up. OK, uh, you can hear me. Yep. OK, first, I want to thank you for that fascinating presentation. I'm lucky enough to have an autographed copy of the 1921 book. And when I bought it my, and read it, my first thought was, I'm just sorry my grandfather's dead because he was at the 1921 World Series. He saw those games and he would love to read about New York in 1921. <laughs> so um, with that, that said, you know, you, you really caught the, the, the era as well as the two teams. My question what, is- What year did your grandfather, was he born? My grandfather was born on Christmas Eve in 1895. Okay. And okay. he became a Giants fan in 1908 when his older brother Izzy took him to the polo grounds to watch uh, Christy Matheson fire a three zip shutout against the Cincinnati Reds. And he was hooked. And Izzy worked for McGraw and Arnold Rothstein in the, um, the pool hall they co owned. And Izzy wound up helping to rig the 1919 World Series. So, wow. um, yeah, he uh, he paid for that. He skimmed off of Rothstein and is forever a, a, a part of the uh, infrastructure of New York. He's holding up the Hellgate Bridge. Huh. Anyway, anyway, my question is, is um, pretty much how much did... Babe Ruth's injury kill the Yankees' chances of winning. I mean, you think the Giants would have won anyway, or do you think it was, uh, you know, it was Ruth's injury? I've, I've, I've often wondered about what it was, because that World Series reminds me a little bit about, like, 1955, when Mickey Mantle got hurt, and then the Dodgers won the Series in seven over the Yankees. Yeah, you know, it's always fun to talk about that, and you don't know uh, injuries do play uh, a role. It's um, in 1922, and I think uh, we just talked about the 1922 race. Late in the season, George Sisler hurt his arm, and in that right. big series against the Yankees, late in the season, the Yankees took two out of three, won the pennant by one game. Sisler couldn't even raise his arm above his uh, shoulder, uh, and and, uh, and then in 1921, it was Tris Speaker was injured late in the season. And he was hobbled. So injuries make a big thing. The only thing is, Ruth did play early in the series, and it wasn't. Um, it, it didn't in the first couple of games. He didn't. He didn't do that much. Um, so, and then again in 1922, he was so anxious. And uh, you know, when you're a fastball hitter, and and maybe Ruth got more discipline as he as he went along. You got to take what you give him, and they were just throwing him junk balls. You know, the book that Lyle and I just wrote uh, uh, that published this year in 1929, Howard Emke started game one of the, if I can veer uh, Gary off of uh, this book for a minute, uh, game one of the 1929 World Series in Wrigley Field. And Howard Emke was a junk pitcher. Uh, and he only appeared in nine games that year in 1929. And quite frankly, most people thought, including his own players, that Connie Mack had lost his mind. But what ended up happening is an empty handcuff in game one, he won the game, I think it was three to one, and he threw all the junk. Joe McCarthy, the coach of the, of the uh, Cubs, called him, excuse my language, but he called empty a shit pitcher. And he knew that, but the, they were expecting George Earnshaw. They were expecting Lefty Grove, and they just right. wanted to hit fastballs. And then this guy comes along and just throws them what appears to be easy, easy stuff. And that, that's what they just they just threw garbage at him and uh you know he i think he learned you know to, to be more patient but i don't know if you know the series was so close if the final game is one to nothing on a and and actually we believe that that had a lot to do with um peck and paws being being traded uh he was not forgiven and most of the newspapers again didn't make a lot of it but what ended up happening was the ball got away from him and he booted it and it didn't go crashing into left field it sort of went maybe 10, 15 feet. Uh, and I'm trying to remember who the runner was on second base. Peckinpah just sort of, you know, he had that 
that uh, moment where, you know, he, he just was so surprised that he made the error. The runner would have stayed on third base if he had just gone and picked the ball up. So right. uh, hard, hard to say. We always, that's where we have fun. Injuries do have a big role. Thank you, Dave. Steve, you're up. Uh, Steve, great, uh, great book like Mars. I bought it, I guess, when it came out several years back. Did you have any opportunity, I'm not sure if it was in the book, to speak to Babe Ruth's granddaughter? You know, I just posted on Facebook about a week ago a picture of me with her at a nine conference. But even then, I mean, I think she was fairly plugged in on it. And maybe Dan Levitt knows. Uh, I don't know if Dan was at that meeting. But uh, I didn't talk to her specifically. Didn't talk to her specifically about that. I had the ability when I started writing baseball stuff in the late uh, around 1999, 2000, connecting with a handful of players that were still alive um, that played against Shocker and against Ruth, Billy Rogel being one of them, the leadoff hitter for the Tigers. I visited him in his in his rest home uh, just a couple of weeks before he died. Um, but no, no, I did not. You know, you you you, you wish you could uh, you know sit down with people and talk about it. Yeah, it's a great read, though. Did a great job. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Frank, you're up, Frank. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. And before I ask the question, I want to make sure I got it correctly. What is the uh, web address for dressed for the uniforms? You know, I don't have in front of me. If you just do a dressed, a Google dressed to the nines, yeah. and Nine then in the Google search, add the word baseball, because dressed to the nines is obviously. Nines figure are spelled out. Uh, you can just, spelled out. You can, yeah, spell, you can spell it out. Uh, and then. Wow. And then you'll get the link. It'll come up, and uh, and then you have to click on, and you can search. But it's 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 really a wonderful uh, aid. You can also I, find it on baseball uniforms of the 20th century. Thank you. Now, I want I some of you know the answer to this because I raised it before. I just want to see if Steve knows it. Frankie Frisch is one of two guys that went to Fordham, named Frankie, played varsity baseball, and became Cardinals. Can you name the other? Boy. Oh. Frankly. Oh, this is going to be a trick question. It's a trick question. You Some of them know it. Want me to uh, give you the answer? Leahy. Leahy. No. When Steve, when Steve requested, I'll give the answer. Um, I'm, I'm not very knowledgeable when it gets beyond 1930. I, so it was beyond 1930. Frankie Spellman. Frankie Spellman became a cardinal. Oh, it's wow. Special. That's a good one. Very yeah. good. Yeah, that, that should be on Je that should be on Jeopardy. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, before we go to uh, Dan Levitt, Perry, you had some comments. Did you want to share one of them? Turn on your turn off. Turn on your mic. Yeah, Steve, hey, thank you so much. And I just want to um, promote your upcoming book about Mike Donlan because I had the privilege of reading a little bit of an advanced copy and I had no idea he is such a fascinating character and I am just uh, I'm thrilled that uh, you've tackled him which you know I guess there haven't been that many books written specifically about him and that you and um, Lyle chose him to write about it I think it's just fantastic so yep. when is that coming out? When, when... Oh, I, you know, Lyle and I spent a lot of time in our books. That book is still a ways away. Oh, in, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Because at at that point, that would what you looked at was the the first half uh, of the manuscript, and actually, Donlan's life gets a lot more complicated. Um, uh, you know, as he gets more into his marriage, and then the tragic, the tragic death of his wife at the height of her career from cancer. And, and then uh, his Hollywood career. And, and Lyle and I both think that probably the reason why he hasn't been tackled in, in a traditional baseball biography is because his, his life is so complicated. I mean, the mm -hmm. amount of time that I've had to get into to understand what vaudeville really was. And now what I'm doing is now that Mabel has died, we're getting into the 1913 time frame, and, you know, the beginning of film and what that was really like. So uh, it'll be... I'd be surprised if it comes out in 2024, actually, really. It may be 2025, but, uh, and as Lyle and I have gotten older, we tend to, or maybe me more than him, I may be slowing him down, is, you know, we enjoy the process as much as the end product, 
and and developing the story and we go back and we edit it and so forth but uh, Lyle in, uh, goes back even I think with his history knowledge earlier than me because he's written biographies of guys like Bill Dolan from the late 19th century early 20th we we were both shocked at how good Mike Donlan really was and to give you guys a teaser in 1908 the famous race with the Merkle game New York newspaper said there was no question who was the most popular New York baseball player in 1908. It wasn't even a contest. And this, I think, was the year that Matthewson won 33 games. It was, Donlin. 30. it was Donlin. And maybe because Donlin was more of a bad boy, and Matthewson's image has gotten sort of burnished because of his tragic death and everything, and he was a very aloof kind of guy. But thank you. Well, hopefully we'll all be well enough to have Steve back then. Uh, Dan, you're up. Well, first of all, I just want to echo Perry. Um, I'm looking forward to that book too, Steve. You and I have talked about Don Lennon and McGraw a lot, and that, that, that's going to be a fun book. Um, my, I, my question is, is, I'm just curious, you know, Huggins seemed to just not get along with, with Carl Mays at all. He hated him. He had the issue with Joe Bush, you know, in, in the World Series as well. And I'm just curious what your take is on sort of how Huggins got along with those two and why it was so contentious particularly with Mays, but just the lack of respect that Bush and probably other pitchers showed. You know, you might have some insight into that. You know, I, I think, again, the, the Yankees of the early 1920s um, were built around, by and large, guys that were stars elsewhere. And, and Bush was a star with Philadelphia, and Mays was certainly a star in Boston. And, and, and they came to New York, and they probably felt they didn't need to be managed. And again, uh, you know, who, and, and there, was, there was always that thing, if a guy's a shrimp, a little guy, you know, how can he possibly manage big guys? And, and Huggins was tiny. Um, so I, I, and that's, you know, most of those prima donnas were gone when the team won 26, 27, and, and, and 28. And in combing through all the records, I never have come across anything where Huggins made a statement when they were trying to get Mays, there was a whole controversy. That's a book in itself when the fight with uh, Ban Johnson, when Mays walked off on the day. <coughs> I, I don't think Huggins wanted, he knew that Mays was a trouble uh, to begin with. I don't think he wanted Mays. And quite frankly, I don't know if it was uh, an example of when Rupert and Huggins clashed. I don't know to what extent. I mean, what's your insight into it? You looked at, the, at the, those years as much as I have, if not more. Well, it's, it's been a while since I looked at him. I, I, I'm, I still wonder, you know, whether or not he thought Mays was throwing games um, as part of the reason he hated him so much. Because he gave him away and actually, I think, tried to sabotage his career there at the end. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's, you know, it's very hard. I mean, we take a hard look at that World Series game where supposedly uh, the, the stories, uh, you know, we don't know all of them. One part of the story was, that Mays' wife was delivered money in the stadium in the eighth inning. And then once she got the money, she signaled to her husband, now you can start walking the guys or whatever. But I mean, that story, now there, not to say that there's nothing there, but that story is sort of odd. I mean, if Carl Mays is going to get bribed, I, I don't think a, a gambler is going to give her a sack of money in the eighth inning at the Yankee at uh, Polo Grounds. But, you know, it's, it, it's hard to know. He was a very unsavory character. And what makes that book that uh, Professor Mike Sowell has written, The Pitch That Killed, if, if you guys enjoy this era, boy, I recommend that book, The Pitch That Killed. The, the, when, Carl, when Ray Chapman was killed in 1920, if they had a popularity contest in 1920, who was the most despised and disliked player in the game and who was the most beloved player of the game? Mays would have won the first award and Chapman would have won the second. And Mays delivered the pitch that killed Chapman even though most people, even the ones that are suspicious about Mays and throwing games, say he did not intend to kill Chapman at that time. Uh, you know, Chapman was a notorious uh, plate crowder, and it was a cloudy day late afternoon. The ball was not white. That was before they, that was one of the things that uh, really clinched the deal to make sure white balls stayed in play all the time. Uh, oh, I'll pay the check now. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Have you, Steve. Anybody have a question that uh, has not asked one yet? All right, uh, Steve. 
Yes. Uh, we cannot thank you enough. And again, best place to get the uh, the, tr the trio of books and the 1921 any site but Amazon would probably be the, the go-to one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Amazon's one where most everybody writes. You know, we, we're very fortunate here in Seattle. We have a bookstore called Elliott Bay Books, and it is literally one of the most thriving in, indie independent bookstores in America. And uh, you go in there, and most days when I wander in there, you know, I, I see 50, 75 people. So there is life after Amazon uh, in some cases, but you got to do it smart and you got to do it right. It's a, it's an amazing store. And if anybody comes to Seattle to visit, give me a holler, but make sure you get up on Capitol Hill uh, to check out the uh, Elliott Bay Book Company. And again, Steve, you know, you have an open invitation when the book uh, on Donlin comes out. Please let's all give it up for uh, Steve Steinberg. Woo Steve, Thank you, Steve, very much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me, Gary. And uh, yeah, good luck. You're doing an amazing job with all these uh, almost week by week. It's, Thank you very uh, much. It, it's really fun if I smoke. Yeah. Next week, we have uh, Don Jensen. Don is going to be talking about the relationship of Harry M. Stevens with the New York Giants and then the San Francisco Giants. And it'll be very interesting, you know, be talking about hot dogs and sodas and, you know, baseball. It, it's going to be a great evening. Wow. Uh, I'm going to have.